I never planned to be a park ranger married to a bear. That's just the way things turned out. I was a single woman puppeteer who had been performing in the schools for way too long. I needed a business partner to make the schlepping easier and the road trips more fun. I also needed a partner in my personal life to make schlepping through that easier and the rest of it more fun. One full moon night, returning from a school gig in northern Maine, I put out a howl to the universe. Send me a reasonable boyfriend. <laughs> Two days later, on my 40th birthday, a Hallmark card arrived in the mail. I did not recognize the return address. <laughs> On the front of the card was the picture of a handsome man in a cocky vest and a crocodile Dundee style adventurer's hat, pushing a beautiful candlelit cake through the vegetation of the rainforest. It said, wishing you a happy birthday. And when I opened it, and cake. It was signed, a secret admirer. How great is that? <laughs> His name, David somebody, and phone number were written underneath. Well, it so happened that at the same time I was doing this puppetry in the schools, I was also doing some stand-up storytelling, not unlike what I'm doing here tonight, only this show was titled Waiting for the Mail. <laughs> M-A-I-L dot, 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 M-A-L-E. Truth. Apparently, this David person had seen the show, found out from a mutual friend that my birthday was coming up, and the rest, as they say, is historic. <laughs> his timing and his approach could not have been more poetically perfect. On our first date, I analyzed his hands. Long fingers, knobby knuckles, callous palms, a working man's hands that moved with a certain elegance that made them capable of holding and animating a <laughs> puppet. And of holding and animating me. <laughs> Ballroom dance lessons were part of the courtship. That pretty much sealed the deal for me. Four months later, we were married. I had no time to waste. I wanted my life to change. David wanted his life to change too. Four months after that, we were business partners. I chose to take a risk. For whatever reasons, at that time, in both of our lives, we were ready to step away from the separate lives we knew to take that grand leap of faith into one together we could never have predicted. <laughs> Along with the right hands for the job, David had the right resume. He played bass in a band, so on stage experience in front of an audience. He'd been a DJ, so good vocal control. The man knew how to speak into a microphone, and he knew how to entertain. Plus, he could weld. <laughs> Not that welding is thought of as a traditional skill useful to puppetry. But when I saw David put on a leather apron, <laughs> strap leather chaps to his thighs, slip his hands into thick leather gloves, and pull down a protective shield mask over his face, before flipping a switch on a propane tank to shoot out a long blue flame that sent sparks flying all over the place, well, damn. <laughs> I was just pleased as punch that I had married a welder. 
<laughs> His friends called him Torch. <laughs> A big story had been brewing in my imagination for quite some time. It had too many characters for me to do as a one-person show. But now that I had the talents of Torch, <laughs> I set to work on it. Now, this story featured a late bloomer kangaroo who was reluctant to leave his mother's pouch. So I built a great big kangaroo costume for myself, long tail, head, the works, climbed into it, and became Mama Roo who operated a hand puppet, Joey, from her pouch. This device works surprisingly well. <laughs> G'day, mites. My name's Joey. I'm a baby kangaroo living in me mom's pouch. Joey. What is it, mom? Today is your eighth month birthday. Do you know what it means for a kangaroo to be eight months old? Righto. It's going to be a big shaboo, and I'm getting a present. No, Joey. I'm getting the present. <laughs> it's called freedom. You are leaving my pouch today. But mom, no buts about it. He was leaving. Well, it took about three to five minutes to get in and out of that costume, which I had to do a couple of times during the show. So something had to happen out in front of the stage while I was backstage changing wrote a subplot for David's character. He became Ned, the swagman, the ballroom dancing partner of Matilda, the emu, a long-necked, long-legged, flightless bird. It wasn't until I was trying to instruct David in how to waltz with Matilda <laughs> that I saw that the khaki vest I'd sewn for him and the cock leather hat he wore made his character of Ned the Swagman a dead-on look-alike for the cake-bearing man in the birthday card he'd sent me only one year before. <laughs> wow. <sighs> Rehearsals were hell. <laughs> if there was one thing that David and I agreed upon during our entire performance career, it was that rehearsing together was pure, unpaid agony. I tried to explain to him, we create stories by getting together to um, ad lib and improvise and um, um, experiment, you know, try things out, see what works, what doesn't, what works, we keep, what doesn't, we throw out, and, and that's how we finesse the story. Understand? <laughs> Can't you just do that someplace else and call me when you're done? Show setups were tense, very tense. But when the music came up, rum, bum, bum, ba, da, rum, bum, bum, ba, da, the puppets and the costume characters swept us into their roles, and we went to Australia. Bum, bum, ba, da, bum, ba, dee, 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 bum, taking our audiences with us. The creation of our first show, Joey, A Kangaroo's Tale, was pretty much a magical fairy tale adventure. It was joyful. It was fun. David and I agreed on another thing. We wanted to do good in the world. So for our next show, I tackled a social issue. At the time, the anti-drug <coughs> rhetoric was pretty much the same, as far as messages were concerned, as were Brer Rabbit Tales. Be careful whom you trust. Don't follow someone without knowing where they're leading you. Actions have consequences, etc. <laughs> and so I adapted a few Brer Rabbit Tales, titled the show, Here Comes Trouble, 
and pitched it to schools as an anti-drug program. Schools didn't buy it. <laughs> the connection between drugs and rabbits was just too much of a stretch. But the characters were so rich. And David's voice skills really came into play when he brought to life bodacious tea for trouble, snake, and brer turtle, and brer fox, and brer gator. And I was, how did do, brer rabbit, and sister possum. All these characters played well together. We played well together with them. So I dropped the drug connection, went for pure story, and that show started to be fun. Not easily dissuaded from doing good in the world, we tackled another social issue, this time the environment, a big problem, which requires everyone's involvement to find a solution. So I created a big residency show, which required everyone's involvement to be performed. Titled it Trash World, cast David as Trash Man, <laughs> the main villain. I was the director. I set us up to rehearse not only together, but with upwards of 100 student participants for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Rehearsals were not our strong suit. I should have known better. Trash world just about trashed the relationship. It was time, time to back off, downsize, and simplify. Enter. Mr. Bear and Company, a technically simple show of story skits and dancing bits which could be performed outdoors. Now, it was David's turn to climb into the costume. <laughs> he got to wear a full bear suit while I donned a ranger hat to become Ranger Pat, Mr. Bear's teacher, coach, and protector. Everybody loves a life-size teddy bear. This show was a hit from the onset. It became our main staple breadwinner. It gave us our big break. New York City. New York, where Mr. Bear and company played a very long run from 1992 to 2004. We played on Broadway. <laughs> on the corner of 246th Street, <laughs> on the open lawn, next to the public toilets of Van Cortlandt Park, but it was Broadway. <laughs> For 13 summers, we traveled from our New Hampshire home to small inner city parks in Manhattan, Staten Island, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx as part of the Arts in the Parks summer programming. Being discovered actually meant that Patrick Epstein, booker for the parks, met, liked, and booked the bear. At last, the right social issue had found us by performing good, solid family entertainment in those parks, we were helping to make them safer, cleaner, and more desirable for outdoor recreation. We were improving the environment. We were doing good in the world. But before we hit the big city big time, we were honing our skills right here, closer to home, at such events as the teddy bears Picnic, a local fundraiser sponsored by your friends of the library. <laughs> Our career in children's theater was one of the few about which people would constantly tell us, oh, you must have such fun together. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Our children's librarian was one such person. She called to say, 
We thought it would be such fun if Mr. Bear could come to this year's teddy bears picnic to lead the children and their decorated teddy bears around the town green for the teddy bear judging contest. Yes, it's the teddy bears parade. Oh no, we don't want a full show. No, we just want Mr. Bear. <laughs> Which seemed like an innocent enough request. If you go into the woods today. I mean, all we had to do was to show up and suit up. So I agreed. We'll do it. You're in for a big surprise. <laughs> well, showing up meant parking our van on the edge of the town green, opening up the rear hatch, draping it with curtains to create a makeshift dressing room tent, we, which we referred to as Mr. Bear's den. <laughs> Suiting up, for me, meant putting on a pair of shorts, shirt, brown felt ranger hat. For David, the procedure was a tad more tedious. To become Mr. Bear, he first ringed his head with triple sweatbands. He put on a t-shirt, swimming trunks, and thick cotton socks. Over these, he pulled warm-up pants and a long sleeve sweatshirt. Because long ago, he was told by the mascot of the Chicago Bulls that wearing full sweats was the only way to protect the interior of his costume from becoming soaked with perspiration. At a certain point, David had assured me, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. <laughs> Hot doesn't get any hotter. It just gets thicker and wetter. <laughs> to replace the electrolytes that he inevitably lost inside of that suit, he strapped a 32-ounce container of iced Gatorade to his chest with, <laughs> with an adjustable sippy straw that he could reach with his mouth. <laughs> Only then was he ready to step into the body of his costume, the equivalent of putting on an oversized pair of plush, fake, furry, footed pajamas lined in three-quarter inch foam. Oh. <laughs> he pushed his hands into his foam-lined paws, thunk, thunk, and then called me to assist with the next step. Ranger Pat! I picked up the bear head, a separate unit, about the same shape and dimensions as a medium-sized birdcage, which I placed over his head. Up the Velcro strips, press them together, attach the body of the costume to the head, and then zip the man into the bear suit. My husband was now contained inside of his own personal sweat lodge. <laughs> his pores were very clean. I like to think that each time I zipped him into that suit, I provided the man with an opportunity for an excellent cardiovascular workout. <laughs> Friends of the library had toiled through the night packing peanut butter sandwiches, brownies, and thousands of gummy bears into 500 paper sacks. For every bear that ever there was is, will gather there for certain because today the day the teddy bears have the picnic. It was an 85 degree, <laughs> sunny summer. Saturday, which brought out an unprecedented 1,000 children and parents. <laughs> By 11 a.m., friends were racing off to Market Basket for more half-gallon jars of creamy-style Peter Pan peanut butter and loaves of Wonder Bread. There's lots of marvelous things to eat and wonderful games to play. Lines for the games and the face painting were way too long. The volunteer stage acts, a boy scout doing card tricks. <laughs> <laughs> a 
and three mothers dressed as clowns, juggling smiley face bean bags, were way too lame. <laughs> Once those kids had finished their peanut butter sandwiches, stuck gummy bears onto their foreheads, <laughs> and launched their whales of protest skyward after helium balloons, which had escaped their grip, <laughs> wasn't much left for them to do while waiting for the teddy bears parade, except to chase each other around the town green. Beneath the trees where nobody sees, we'll hide and seek as long as we please, because that's the way the teddy bears have the picnic. I was waiting for the children's librarian to give me the high sign that the parade was about to begin. She was way over on the far side of the town green, balancing a boombox on her shoulder. I knew it was cranked to maximum volume playing the teddy bear's picnic. I also knew that it could only be heard by about the half dozen kids running around her. <laughs> As I waited, I watched the movements of the three clown mothers become more and more frantic as they tried to corral and harness the energy of about 700 preschoolers, now mostly separated from their own mothers, into forming a single line with their teddy bears. <laughs> this was going to take a while. Place yourself, if you will, inside David's bear costume. <laughs> as he waited. <clears throat> Inhale the rank air of a confined space, regularly treated with a combination of fresh again costume spray and Stetson cologne. <laughs> or Brut, or Old Spice, or whatever David may have gotten from his relatives in Nebraska that year. <laughs> Limit your sight to what can be seen between the spaces of the burlap weave over Mr. Bear's snout. Imagine how helpless and vulnerable you are and feel sympathy for the man inside the suit. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> I got the high sign from the children's librarian, passed it through the curtained dressing room, and watched the bear stumble out. <laughs> Shit! <sighs> Is there any oxygen out here? I can't breathe. Give me some paw. We slap five, our traditional signal to each other that we were ready to go. Now David was nothing if not stoically determined to do the job that needed to be done. The son of a Lutheran minister, his Midwestern Calvinistic roots of Self-sacrifice and service went deep. Over the years, I had observed that the man could put up with a lot of physical discomfort in exchange for the adoration of children, for the affection, the bear hugs, the, I'm at the bear. I love you. <laughs> so off he marched. If you go into the woods today, with Ranger Pat fast on his heels. You're in for a big surprise. <laughs> we navigated our way along the edge of the crowd, trying to locate the very unclear beginning of the parade line. It's lovely down in the woods today. As preschool faces turned toward us, <laughs> but safer to stay at home. <laughs> now, 
<clears throat> Maybe every four-year-old feels powerless in a world of larger beings. And maybe that is why, when hundreds of them are gathered together in the same place, and bear in mind, you should never gather hundreds of <laughs> four-year-olds in the same place for any reason, they look around and recognize that there is strength in numbers. <laughs> well, a six-foot-tall bear in a pork pie hat and star-covered shorts was the best thing these kids had seen all morning. More faces turned toward us, and more faces turned toward us, and suddenly I could see a single thought bubble appear <laughs> above the collective little heads. Pull down his pants. <laughs> A sea of unattended children surged toward us, quickly separating me from Mr. Bear's plaintive screams of, raise your pants! I watched him hold up a tiny teddy bear as some sort of protective shield <laughs> as scores of preschoolers eye level to the top of his shorts closed in, grabbed hold, and pulled down. <laughs> There is nothing funnier to a four-year-old than depanting a great big bear. It has all the biblical drama of David felling Goliath, <laughs> combined with the Looney Tune humor of Tweety Bird wonking Sylvester the cat. I think I taught a putty bat. <laughs> I did, I did. To make the best, the very best entertainment for everybody. Except, of course, for Goliath, Sylvester, and the guy inside the bear suit. <laughs> I pushed aside mothers, now trying to reach their own children, to reach and rescue the man inside the suit. Ranger Pat, get over here. When I finally <laughs> got there to throw my whole body weight protectively against his backside, hard little fists were pounding against his furry belly and sides. Little hands were grabbing at him and tearing at him. He couldn't move because his pants were down over his furry feet. He was stuck in place as they pushed him and shoved him and yanked on him. Mr. Bear is an endangered species. We must protect our endangered species. But I could not access their sense of personal responsibility. Finally, the three clown mothers arrived to organize the other mothers into mother and child reunions. <laughs> Children collapsed on the ground and hysteria was selectively grabbed and pulled from the scene. <sighs> when it was over, David was quiet. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. Usually, after he'd walked like a bear, talked like a bear, and danced inside that bear suit, he was, in fact, a bear. <laughs> but now, I heard him breathing. I listened to him slurp his Gatorade. <laughs> I watched him slowly shuffle in front of me toward the van <laughs> and then stop. I reached down to pull up his shorts when he said no. <laughs> First, we do this. Raise your right paw. Repeat after me. <laughs> I, Ranger Pat, do solemnly swear to make Mr. Bear a pair of suspenders and attach them securely to his shorts. And I also promise never to leave his backside in a crowd situation again. And I also promise never, ever, ever, 
ever, ever, ever, ever, ever, ever to book another teddy bear's picnic <laughs> again. <laughs> ever. I promise. Cross my heart and hope to die if Ranger Pat should tell a lie to her longtime partner, Mr. Bear. Give me some paw. <laughs> And there we stood, the deep pants bear <laughs> and the quivering ranger, alone together on the town green amidst a festive disarray of abandoned, unjudged teddy bears. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was obvious <clears throat> that the bear and the ranger were not going to make their living doing the teddy bear's picnic circuit. <laughs> but other than that fiasco and a few others similar to it, we now had a good show. It worked for us. It made it, us money. It was easy and it was flexible. If I got a new idea, I no longer had to go to the trouble of creating a whole new show. I could just plug in a new story, pull one out, try something else, work with ideas as they came to me. I was watching public television one night when they had a documentary about whooping cranes, an endangered species from the Midwest. Great big birds, big broad wings, long legs. They do a wonderful mating dance. There was a biologist who was trying to encourage them to mate more because they were endangered, so he wanted more eggs, more babies, and you know, this was part of the foreplay thing. So he learned how, or was trying at least, to, to do their dance. So the show had the biologist imitating them, and it had them dancing with him and dancing with each other, and it was pretty spectacular. So I started thinking about whooping cranes, envisioned a mother whooping crane and an egg. She lays an egg and then she has an errand and she goes off and Mr. Bear comes by and he reaches down, puts his paws and it hatches. And I got a call from the New Hampshire Audubon Society. Do you have a story about loons? We're looking for a story about loons for our special family weekend. They're uh, native species that's uh, protected? Well, no. I was sorry to tell them that we didn't have a story about loons. However, we're working on one about a whooping crane. When did you say your special family weekend was? OK. Well, that's enough lead time. If you'd settle for an endangered species from the Midwest, then um, Maybe we could use your official date as our official debut. They went for it. The Audubon Society advertised the debut of the whooping crane in its newsletter, put it in calendar listings across the state, and we had a deadline. A great big whoop whooping crane puppet was created along with an oversized egg, great big chick, nest, frying pan, all the props were in place. <laughs> Had two months to finesse the story. Spent about six weeks procrastinating. Because rehearsing together was a Punch and Judy show. Well, are you ready to rehearse? Not yet. Can't we just go to our separate rooms, memorize our lines, and get together later? Well, no. We have no lines to memorize. Uh, that's why we're getting together now. You know, to improvise, ad lib, try things out, experiment a little, see what works, what doesn't, to finesse the story. 
You mean we have no story to rehearse? Well, not yet. First, we've got to discuss a game plan. Oh, no. <laughs> not another one of your game plans. Why does it always have to be my game plan? Why can't it be our game plan? Why must you always bring this attitude to the work? Why can't you just bring the work to the rehearsal? <laughs> Fine. I can see you're in no mood to cooperate. <laughs> cooperate on what? On what we're trying to do here. Cooperate with me on coming up with a game plan. All right. I'm cooperating. What's your game plan? <laughs> well, first, we've got to talk. OK, so talk. I am talking. But you've got to talk, too. Look, I am talking. You are talking. This is where talking gets us. Nowhere. <sighs> That's because we're not communicating. <laughs> oh, we're communicating all right. We're communicating just fine. What we're not doing is rehearsing. <laughs> <laughs> we got through it. And then, ready or not, it's showtime. The van was packed. We were headed off on 101 toward the Audubon Center. When I couldn't shake the sniggling feeling that something was missing, I went through my mental checklist. That stone's at the house. Oh, okay. Oh, mm -hmm. there. Uh oh. I did not say this out loud because any utterance of those two syllables while we were underway was sure to upset the driver. <laughs> so, I just envisioned how our brand new whooping crane puppet was constructed. Its great long wings had been designed to fold flat against its body and central rod mechanism for easy storage and transport. The long head and neck had been made as a detachable unit for the same reasons. I tried to picture both of those pieces together in the bag and just couldn't see them both. <laughs> Maybe David packed that bag. His and my separate packing responsibilities for this new skit had not yet been assigned to the checklist. I must have looked over in his direction, because suddenly I heard, what? <laughs> I hadn't even said, uh-oh. Um, I was just wondering, I don't want to hear this. I'm pretty sure I don't want to hear this. Well, I thought I'd like to check on the whooping crane. Why? The bag's in the back. I can see it in the rearview mirror. Yeah, but did you pack that bag? No. <laughs> you packed it. Why? Well, I'm, I'm just not sure that, it, that the head got packed. You didn't pack the head? Well, I might have. You mean you might not have? I mean, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And um, until you pull over so that we can check in the bag, we're not going to know. Oh, great. Great. The debut of the whooping crane, and you didn't pack the head. <laughs> Look, I don't know if I didn't pack the head. <laughs> it's a new puppet, a new skit, Murphy's Law. Things happen. Right. Things just happen. Blame it on Murphy and his law. Never take personal responsibility for the things that happen. 
Well, either it's there or it's not. Too late to do anything about it now. <laughs> it's not too late. And I can't stand to sit here for the whole rest of the trip not knowing whether or not we've got the head in the bag. <laughs> well, I guess you'll just have to deal with it. <laughs> dealing with it. Pull over right now. We pulled over. I checked in the back of the van, looked in the bag. Great, just great. The debut of the whooping crane, and we can't do the skit. We've got to do the skit. It's been advertised all over the state as the whooping crane's debut. We've got to do it. Oh, that's going to be fine. That's going to be really cute. You're going to hoist the headless bird up over the backdrop. <laughs> the audience is going to love that. No, I'm not going to hoist the headless bird over the backdrop. We're going to go home to get the head. We don't have time. We have no choice. Look, we allowed a little extra time for the setup. We're 20 minutes out. That's 40 minutes round trip. If you had pulled over, <laughs> when I first brought this up, you're pushing it. You are pushing it. He was right. I was pushing it. Turn around, David. Go home. We have no choice. We went home. We got the head. We got to the Audubon Center about 25 minutes before our 2 p.m. showtime. <laughs> Somebody's familiar with puppetry. <laughs> now, our setup takes well over an hour. So we put all actions in fast forward. I sacrificed a bathroom trip, and we weren't doing too bad. By just five minutes after two, David had strapped Gator Aid to his chest <laughs> and was ready to step into the suit. When, uh-oh, uh-oh what? Oh, nothing. What? OK. Uh, last show, uh, we soaked the we. OK, I soaked the bear costume. While I was at it, I washed his shorts. You didn't bring the shorts. You forgot the shorts at home. <laughs> I bought the shorts. I got the shorts. They're right here. Got the shorts. Just didn't get around to put them back on the costume and attach the suspenders. <laughs> but the good news is, at least we didn't leave them at home. We. <laughs> we. Yeah, we, Mr. Bear, we, we are supposed to be having fun, Mr. Bear. Remember fun, that thing we thought we'd have a long time ago? You know, we, fun, we. Hey, hold it, you're scaring me. No, this isn't me being scary. This is me being crazy. You're making me crazy. <sighs> this could still be fun if you just lighten up. And stop sweating the small stuff. Don't talk to me about sweat. <laughs> I once again pulled up his star covered shorts over his two fat belly and butt. Pulled the drawstring tight, tied it in a double bow knot. We don't have time for the suspenders. We, again. <laughs> You'll never change. You'll never change. Right there, I took a moment. 
to contemplate my good fortune. How many among us in this lifetime are granted the opportunity to set, settle a disagreeable interlude with one's spouse by placing a bear head <laughs> over his angry face and securely zipping him inside of a big furry suit. <laughs> Not many, and yet I was one. Change into what, Mr. Bear? Boom, ouch, it's showtime. As tense as we were, the characters of Mr. Bear and Ranger Pat sailed through the familiar stories, saving the last one, the new story for the end. The audience was with us, so full of confidence and optimism. We began and got well into the story of the whooping crane. Mr. Bear was out front bantering about a chick who had hatched from a a, an egg under his care. I was backstage behind our six foot backdrop readying the mother whooping crane for her first appearance. I balanced the long rod mechanism against my stomach, held on to a cylinder which ran up and down it, connected to dowels attached to the wings to make it fly, looking forward to the audience's reaction when she first came into view waiting for my sound cue. Rock-a-bye, baby. That was it. So I hoisted the big bird above the backdrop. Her wings spread out. Her neck reached over. And the audience laughed. This was not a funny puppet. This was a big, beautiful, impressive puppet. But this was not a funny puppet. They laughed again. Ranger Pat, Ranger Pat. That was not part of the script. Uh, whoop, whoop, I said as the mother whipping crane. Um, uh, Mr. Bear, uh, the, the mother whipping crane wants her baby back. That was not part of the script either. The audience laughed again. Ranger Pat, what was going on out there? Then I saw Mr. Bear's snout appear over the edge of the backdrop. And as he shuffled slowly into view, I saw that in one arm he carried an oversized chick in an oversized nest. With the large paw of the other, he was reaching down <laughs> in a futile attempt to pull up his star-covered shorts. <laughs> Depanced once again. I tried to hide in my face the special glee I felt at knowing that not long ago I had zipped inside of that bear suit one angry husband that now needed my help. All conversation was being broadcast over our wireless mics. <laughs> so we had to deal with this dilemma in character. Gee, Mr. Bear, it looks like you dropped your drawers. <laughs> the kids in the audience laugh. That's right, Ranger Pat. Do you know where my suspenders are? <laughs> the adults giggled. Don't worry, Mr. Bear, I'll get right on it. But first, why don't you give the mother whooping crane her baby back? <laughs> whoop, whoop. We continued to vamp as I set down the big whooping crane puppet, took the nest and chick from Mr. Bear, and pulled up his star-covered shorts. <laughs> Gee, Mr. 
Mr. Bear, I sure hope you learn your lesson, Miss. <laughs> I sure did, Ranger Pat. <laughs> there was dead air. <laughs> Why don't you tell me what that lesson is again so we can all remember it? Well, yeah, Mr. Bear, the lesson is uh, never take a chick, uh, an egg, that's it. Now, never take an egg from its nest because because your pants might fall down. <laughs> Some kid in the audience shouted that out and the audience started laughing at their own jokes. <laughs> Once the bear's pants were secured, he went out front to begin the endangered species dance. Well, I took a few moments backstage to compose myself. <sighs> On cue, I went out to join him. But as soon as I saw him, <laughs> all I could see was the angry man inside the bear suit now trying to dance. <laughs> Seeing this made me laugh. Well, the audience took it as permission to start laughing all over again. I tried to get out a line, but every time I said something, I cracked up. Soon, I was straining so hard not to laugh that I felt like wetting my pants. <laughs> Remember that bathroom break I'd sacrificed? I quickly crossed my legs and scurried over to a bench in front of our set to sit down. Well, the women in the audience recognized this maneuver. <laughs> kids who thought it was funny when Mr. Bear's pants had fallen down now heard their mothers laughing at Ranger Pat who was just sitting on a bench with her legs crossed. They didn't understand why that was funny but their mothers was, were laughing so they started to laugh too. It struck me funny that the kids were now laughing without knowing what they were laughing about. <laughs> that made me laugh more which made me feel more like peeing. Which heightened the mother's laughter, which accelerated the kids' laughter. It was the domino effect of hilarity. There was only one person in this whole scene who was not laughing. <laughs> that was the guy inside the bear suit. He just wanted this show to be over. <laughs> Knowing this <laughs> made me laugh. <laughs> Finally, I composed myself enough to control my bladder, finish the story, finish the show. We always end our shows with bear hugs. Kids were coming up to Mr. Bear. Oh, Mr. Bear, that was so funny when your pants fell down. <laughs> Are your pants going to fall down again? <laughs> Not if Ranger Pat attaches my suspenders. <laughs> Adults were coming up to me. That was hilarious. I can't remember when I've laughed so hard. Oh, that bit about the pants falling down. Did you plan for that to happen? <laughs> well, I hedged. Sometimes things just happen. Oh, you have got to keep that bit in the show. That bit is a keeper. <laughs> I would love to get that kind of laughter at every performance, but I'm afraid it would be impossible to duplicate all the things that went wrong which <laughs> led up to it. I'm afraid there can be only one debut like this one. Sometimes things just happen. <laughs> It had been 10 years since that debut, 11 
since we were discovered by New York Parks Department. The city was no longer the scary, dirty, overcrowded, crime-ridden place we had expected it to be. Well, sure, it was most of those things. <laughs> but not scary anymore. Now familiar to us was its 100-degree humid mornings, the feel of melting tarmac under the soles of our shoes. We knew how to dance around dog poop on trodden grass. <laughs> I knew only too well the anxiety of trying to find a place to pee in those parks before showtime. This creative adventure of ours over the years had become less about the performances and more about traveling together. Touring well was the part that required improvisation, ad-libbing, and flexibility. Leaving New Hampshire for a string of days in the graffitied color of the city woke us up. I looked forward to the cacophony of traffic noise combined with people shouting out in different languages to the booming rhythms of construction intersecting with the spicy smells of foreign foods cooking on street corners. But more than anything, what drew us back every summer was the delight of children who circled us in park fountains after shows. David would have stripped down to his t-shirt and swim trunks. I would have taken off my ranger hat and boots. But other than that, fully clothed, walk with him into the fountains where we'd stand together getting thoroughly soaked by jets of water and laughing, splashing children. The heart of our work now pulsed for us in the faces of those kids. Perfect glowing skin, almond, brown, black, yellow, rosy, peachy, scrubbed faces of children beaming up at Ranger Pat and looking to Mr. Bear for hugs. Van Cortland Park was quiet on this Saturday morning. Usually when we arrived at a park, the first thing we did was to set up our sound system. And we'd plug in a tape to announce our presence, and then crank up the volume to compete with screeching subways, whirring sirens of police and ambulance, city noise. Not today. Today, the tape we played interfered with the quiet. So we turned it off. It was September 15th, 2001, four days after 9-11. And we were setting up for a show in the Bronx. You don't have to come. Alfredo, the park sponsor I talked with on the phone, had talk, told me, we would understand if you didn't. We know they canceled your show in Central Park on Friday. But we're on the outskirts. You can get here from there. We don't know if people will show. We don't know what to expect. But we'd like to keep the show on schedule, if you're willing. David and I talked it over. We didn't know at the time if another attack might be imminent, if we might be putting ourselves in harm's way. But to cancel seemed cowardly to us unpatriotic. It seemed like the right thing to do to leave our safe New Hampshire home for the city's recent tragedy because, well, Ranger Pat and Mr. Bear belong there now. We had our role to play. We'll do it, I told Alfredo. And we soldiered our way into the city. Over 300 people turned out for that show, bringing with them into the park the laughter of children. Parents wanted to see their kids being kids again. As we told our stories, Mr. Bear danced and sang. His pants stayed on this time. 
Ranger Pat encouraged, chided, and comforted him. We made ourselves and all who came feel safe. At the end of that show, every kid wanted a bear hug. Ranger Pat lifted child after child into Mr. Bear's arms. He hugged, held, and gently set down each one. Minutes went by. A half hour went by. Sweating, exhausted, I kept lifting. David kept hugging. Neither one of us had the heart to shut off the line. Mr. Bear, you stink. <laughs> said one cute little bundle of innocence. <laughs> Mr. Bear needs to go back to his den to take a bath and a nap. <laughs> Everybody wave goodbye to Mr. Bear. Bye, Mr. Bear. We love you. David lumbered off to the van where he collapsed on his back. When I opened the curtains, I saw a round furry mound <laughs> of bear belly. What took you so long? Sit up. I helped him. Hurry. I unzipped the back of his suit, peeled away the Velcro seal. Faster. Lifted the bear head off. Sweat streamed down his forehead and into his eyes. Visible steam rose off the top of his bald head. He pulled his hands, slippery with sweat, out of his paws. Water. I handed him a gallon jug. He sucked down about a quart. Good show. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kids loved it. Alfredo brought his daughter. That was her you danced with. Was it? Yeah. Alfredo was glad so many people came. He didn't know if they'd show. Said he didn't know what to expect. Nobody does, mm -hmm. said the half man, half bear. Nobody does. Our desire to do good in the world kept us on the road for another three years. But I'd lost the imagination to make up new stories. Even with both of us moving things in and out of the van, the schlepping wasn't easy. And the road trips were no longer fun. Oops. <laughs> I just had a lapse. OK. Um, we both got different part-time jobs, which made the scheduling shows more complicated. Still, the familiar puppets and the stories we knew had a life of their own and continued to carry us along. We stayed together for the puppets. Till one day, I found myself chasing two teenagers down a hot city sidewalk in the Bronx, yelling, drop the bird head, you little jerks. <laughs> I had just assisted David in taking his bare head off when I saw these two kids behind our set reaching for the whooping crane puppet. Drop it! One of them grabbed the head. It came off in his hand, and they just ran with it. Drop the bird head. I took chase. In all the years of our inner city park work, no one had ever stolen anything from us. This puppet was crucial to a show we had booked the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. Without this puppet, we couldn't do the show. The show couldn't go on. Drop the bird head, you little jerks. They were twice as fast as I was. I was four times their age. But something inside me had to chase those two kids, not just to save the puppet, but to try to save them. I had to make them realize that it takes no imagination to quickly grab something and steal it. I had to make them know the importance of what they were taking and the fact that they were taking it from me. 
I had to make them understand that even in a dirty inner city park, imaginations can be encouraged to fly to a better place. Couldn't they realize that they were taking all of this away for no good reason? Drop the bird head, you little jerks. <sighs> that bird head, I, I, I needed them to know that, that Puppets and, and puppet shows have a value which cannot be bought and sold on the street. I had to make them realize that they were taking all of this away and, and that kids need fun and good times. And what about the kids? What about the kids, you little assholes? Drop, what about the kids? These were the kids. What about the kids? What about me? Mm -hmm. My heart rate had reached a maximum rhythm I had never felt before. My lungs were burned raw. But Ranger Pat would not give up. She chased those kids all the way into the projects until they finally disappeared inside of a big, cool building. When the plainclothes policeman arrived at the scene, he asked me, a bird head? <laughs> the head of a puppet bird? You chased those kids into the projects for a puppet? Lady, I wouldn't send one of my men into those projects. Anything can happen there. You're lucky you didn't get shot. I didn't feel lucky. David and I packed up silently. When I opened the van door, I saw my ranger hat on the seat. It fell off about a mile from here. Some mother and her kids brought it back. Doesn't matter. Hey, things happen. David drove into the projects, parked next to a dumpster. I watched him rifle through it, looking for the bird head. He didn't find it. But he pulled out a white fleece jacket with red and black trim. It's clean. <laughs> they threw it back in the van. On our way to the motel that night, he stopped at a hardware store, bought a dowel, some duct tape, and a bag of old-fashioned style wooden clothespins. That night, while I watched television, he cut up an old sweatshirt, duct taped it to the dowel to fashion a long neck and head. He glued one of the <clears throat> clothespins for a beak. He cut feathers from the white fabric of the jacket he'd rescued and glued them onto the neck and head one by one. He made eyes and colored markings from the red and black fabric, picking up the pieces and gluing them together for the show. Good job, I told him. By 11 o'clock that night, he had made a serviceable bird head. Then I tried to summon a little more enthusiasm into my voice. Good job. Why, thank you, Ranger Pat. <laughs> David, I'm not a ranger. Well, what's that supposed to mean? I mean, I'm not just Ranger Pat. Well, I'm not just Mr. Bear. Look. I fixed the bird head so the show could go on. I thought that's what you wanted. Isn't that what you want? Well, yes. But look, I don't have time for this. I really don't have time for this. What more do you want from me? Nothing. Good. Good.
Good night. Good night. The bear suit was retired. The ranger hat was put on a shelf. I had chosen to take a risk. I remember every single one of our debuts, every leap of faith required for each new beginning. I don't remember our last show. It was just the show after which no other show was scheduled. We both needed new roles to play. Bum, 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 ba, da. Rum, bum, ba, da, 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 da. Rum, 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 ba, da, da. the puppet shows with that. <laughs> Didn't really mean it. <laughs> no, you're free to go, thanks. <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs>